Welcome to the Club Room. My name is Mark Moyer and I am super excited to have a fantastic event today because I've got three, not just one or two, but three amazing people um, who have had their hearts set in philanthropy and uh, in this particular case uh, tied in with sports and making you know, a true impact in the world of sports. All right. So I'm going to, I wrote up a super long intro for each of you. Um, <laughs> yeah. I'm going to start with Michelle. Uh, Michelle's in Phoenix. Um, there's apparently a baseball team doing pretty damn well right now in the World Series. Um, every other team sucks except for, I guess, Texas. So um, we'll see who wins that one out. But she's in Phoenix. Um, she graduated from Arizona State University. She got her undergrad undergrad in psychology, which is scary enough, but then also her master's degree in, in criminal justice. So watch out. Um, she founded Be Daring about five years ago, Be Daring Foundation, and we're gonna learn all about that in a few minutes. Batting second. And she's always good at advancing the runner to second base. It's fantastic. Uh, good bunter, Natalie Hummel. Natalie um, is in Bend, Oregon. Um, I've been to Bend. It's actually a really cool, amazing place. Who knew? Where's, I don't even know where Oregon is, but uh, it's beautiful. I'm joking. I know where it is. Um, <laughs> but, uh, graduated from Cal State. Uh, got her master's degree from Boulder, where she, um, I don't even know if she actually studied much there, because no one studies in Boulder. They just spend a lot of time having fun. Unless you're a master's student, of course, Natalie, right? Um, right. Spent some time in the corporate space, but then co-founded Every Kid's Sports, let's see, almost 14 years ago, right? Mm -hmm. Amazing how time flies. Um, I know. But uh, it's an incredible organization. We'll talk about them shortly. Batting third, Roy Kessel. He's the RBI guy, batting in those uh, runners. Um, they were in Chicago and uh, founded SPN, uh, co-founded, I guess, uh, about six years ago. And... Um, He's also the president of a company called Sports Loop, which is sports consulting. Um, and I'm pretty damn thrilled to be involved with SPM these days. So thanks for having me along, whether you like it or not, Roy. So anyway, thanks all for being here. Listen, I, today I really want to focus on not just the impact that philanthropy has in, in the world of sports, but really almost the other way around. What's the impact of sports in philanthropy? And um, I want to start with you, Natalie, actually, because I do, uh, I'm a huge, huge fan of what you do. You know I am. And I think what's um, exciting about what happened with, is happening with every kid's sports is the whole concept of getting kids sort of off the streets or off, or stop them from doing stuff they shouldn't be doing, which may also include too much gaming even, but get them exercising, getting them on the field. But tell me a little, you know, if you could, the, the story of what, what prompted this 14 years ago? What made you wake up one day and say, you know what, dang it, I got to do this? Yeah, it's, uh, I'll try not to make it too long of a story, but uh, I grew up, you know, playing all kinds of sports. Um, I was uh, an athlete from, you know, I started playing uh, baseball when I was five and uh, went on, uh, I had nine letters in high school and went on to play division one volleyball. And, um, you know, sports is the thing that has given me the most in my life and uh, has defined, uh, you know, who I am and what I've been able to do. And um, I had uh, met John Ballantyne, one of the other founders, and we were having lunch and we were just talking about um, what is, you know, what was going on in youth sports and how many kids weren't getting the chance to play. And I had been saying for a while, uh, I'd been telling my husband and different people that I wanted to make a bigger impact. Uh, I was uh, an executive coach and I was working with CEOs, helping them increase their performance uh, in their job. And, you know, I could I was working with about 20 CEOs and and, uh, you know, which was a full uh, plate of people I was working with. And, you know, there was a ripple effect, but there's only so many people that I could work on, work with one on one. And uh, so I kept saying, gosh, I wish I could make a bigger impact. And when John and I started talking and started realizing what was going on in youth sports, it just was like everything kind of aligned of my background in sports, my passion, all the things I'd done in my career. Uh, I'd been doing a lot of sales and, and um, leading organizations just kind of all came together. And we started uh, every kid sports and started helping kids playing sports. And, you know, it took us many years to get a model that really worked and could scale um, and in uh, 2020, we kind of landed on a model that really worked. And uh, from there, we were able to scale nationally. So that's amazing. You know, it's interesting because a lot of times people say, well, 
I can't start something like that, but every one of us can. I mean, that, that, that's the thing. And, and uh, you know, for anybody who thinks, well, they can't just uh, speak to Michelle. Michelle, batter up. Let's go. I mean, tell me a little bit about what what inspired you to start this, uh, you know, a few years ago. Well, I was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder in 2017 as a result of being raped. I share my trauma because there's a big stigma around PTSD to begin with, that most PTSD is coordinated with veterans, when in reality, ever, anybody can get PTSD. So while I was doing my master's degree in criminal justice, I was going to a counselor, not a lot of people supporting me because they didn't understand PTSD, which led me to create the Be Daring Foundation which focuses on uh, students, high school, college students, athletes, and community members really bridging the gap when it comes to mental health and sports and getting the help and the resources you need along with an amazing community that's going to be here to support you. So you wait, you're telling me that athletes uh, have sometimes they have mental health issues? Well, people often forget that athletes are human beings like you and I. They, they see these athletes as as cash cow so to speak and they're like they don't have ptsd they don't have depression they don't have anxiety they don't uh, you know abuse drugs and alcohol and, and do dumb things on dates we're all human we're all bound to make mistakes and so we want to change that conversation by bringing light that athletes are human beings just like the rest of us well it's interesting they mentioned that because uh i had marshall falk uh, in here you know about a year and change ago uh for an event and I think he shocked a lot of people by telling them that he actually suffered from severe depression when he retired. And people say, well, wait, you know, he's got these fabulous houses and cars and, you know, he's got everything he needs. And quite frankly, it's the exact opposite where he was missing the whole, you know, that his, his adrenaline from competing, his locker room, the, uh, the fans, the day to day, you know, physical and, um, nutritional aspects of having a routine everything was gone now he's on a couch and he's kind of like looking at the tv or looking at the wall going like what am i going to do now so you're absolutely right michelle i think every every athlete uh, every competitor when they leave their sport especially and they stop competing they 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 fall off a cliff and they they really need someone down there at the bottom to help catch or at least to stop them from that jump uh but roy Sports Philanthropy Network. So tell me a little bit about what prompted you to start that and, and who does it, what kind of organizations do you like to support? Thanks, Mark. Uh, appreciate being here and, uh, you know, tough acts to follow with, with Natalie and Michelle and the, and the great work that they're doing. Um, for Sports Philanthropy Network, my, my background was in law. I practiced law for 20 years and uh, was an NFL agent and put together celebrity and charity golf events for groups like the Tournament of Roses in Pasadena and the NFL Coaches Association. And one of the things I saw as I got that chance to engage with athletes on a more of a peer level or a representation level compared to a fan level is that they would open up and talk about the work um, that they wanted to do in their communities, what was important to them. And one of the things that, that I noticed was that they had a lot of questions. They didn't really have the support or guidance. They were never given the training that's needed to make that impact in their community. Um, sadly, I think that what we saw is that many of the athletes are kind of conditioned to believe that they're good for four things when they're not competing. And number one is taking photos with people. Number two is signing autographs. Number three is playing in golf outings. And the last one is going to fundraising dinners. And so that's a gross injustice to these individuals that are really highly successful, highly motivated. You don't get to be a professional athlete in any sport without an enormous amount of time and commitment and dedication. And so these, these athletes have a huge capacity and a huge desire to give back to their community. And so that was really the genesis of Sports Philanthropy Network was looking at how could we support those efforts and help them um, expand what they're doing in the community. Uh, it's not always the best decision for every athlete to start their own foundation. Uh, many of them are given bad information about what's involved in that process. Um, and for many of them, they would be better off being sort of front and center and, and being the, uh, the mouthpiece or the, the spotlight for a celebrity golf outing or a party. But it doesn't mean they have to run their own foundation. They could partner with another cause 
another existing organization that already has the staff and already has the infrastructure um, would probably be a much more efficient use of, of their time and, and their skill set. How do you get the word out to, because you're, you're absolutely right, a lot of these uh, men and women sort of jump into it saying, well, you know what, I, I feel like I need to have a legacy and my friends have one and someone else has one and, you know, maybe that's something I can have my aunt or uncle run and that sort of thing. Um, how do you get involved with trying to steer them the right direction? Yeah, it's, it's a tough question because sadly they're uh, led or really misled that that uh, foundation is going to be their lifeblood when they're done playing sports. And for anybody who's been involved in the nonprofit space, you recognize, right, there's, there's not the likelihood that you're going to be getting uh, seven or eight figure salaries is not really a, a reality. Um, when you're playing sports and you fund that operation yourself, Mark, you're absolutely right. A lot of these athletes put either a parent, a spouse, a sibling, or a buddy um, in the position to run that foundation in the meantime. Um, but they're not getting really, in, in most cases, the value um, from what they're compensating that person. If you look at salary structures in nonprofits for executive directors, right, they're, they're typically not making hundreds of thousands of dollars. The ones that are running big operations um, of millions and millions of dollars uh, and athlete foundations rarely get to that scale. Most of them um, dissolve within about three years of the end of their playing career. Um, and the ones that don't take affirmative action to dissolve that end up getting dissolved by the IRS because they probably don't file the appropriate returns and uh, tax filings after a number of years. Yeah, it's a, it's a complete minefield for, for some of these athletes and the as you said, they, you know, they they often have a history of getting some pretty bad advice and it's really unfortunate, but uh, it sounds like SPN is really trying to change the narrative on that. So I, I appreciate that. It's, that's pretty, that's, that's fantastic. Um, so pivoting over to Natalie. Uh, Natalie, so the, tell me a little bit about, you know, what the, that sort of state is of kids playing sports right now in the, in the U.S. Yeah, it's, uh, so when you look at um, overall kids playing, uh, only 35% of kids are playing wow. uh, sports right now, uh, age nine to 13. And, uh, and at age 13, 70% of the kids that are playing are dropping out by age 13. And, um, and then if you look at kids from low income families, uh, it's even worse. Um, so they're uh, only 22% of kids from low-income families are playing, uh, and they're usually only playing an abbreviated season and, um, you know, maybe one sport, um, and it's usually not a full season. Um, so there's, you know, huge inequities, and there's, you know, certain parts of the country where the kids aren't playing at all. There's, you know, no programming. There's uh, huge sports deserts where there's no facilities, there's no programming, uh, and there's no access. So that's a big thing that we're trying to uh, address and, you know, we've unfortunately in our country, we've gone to this um, uh, travel elite uh, uh, model mm -hmm. where kids are, you know, paying families are paying five to thirty thousand mm -hmm. dollars a year per child uh, in these travel programs. And, you know, that just is completely uh, eliminating uh, low income kids. But it's also not serving the kids that are in those programs, uh, unfortunately, because um, we're seeing, you know, huge amounts of burnout in that. 70% dropping out at age 13, a huge part of that is because of all the competitive sports and there's not a lot of recreational sports available for those kids. So they're, it's either, you know, play in the competitive programs or drop out. And, um, you know, there's just a ton of kids that uh, those competitive programs aren't right for, you know, I, I have two kids and my daughter, uh, you know, played soccer and did really well, but she's <laughs> never the kid that's going to sign up for a competitive program. And, um, and then, uh, you know, our son has some uh, coordination and uh, he has a, an illness that impacts him. And, you know, he played uh, sports as well, but, you know, recreational sports was really the, the right level for him. And, um, and, you know, when there isn't anything after age 13 for kids like that to play in, what do they do? They drop out, so. And, you know, it's remarkable because even to this day, I remember I remember the sports I played when I was that age uh, and fondly, and it was um, <clears throat> such a fantastic time to be, and look, it was a different world and a different everything. And 
you know, we didn't have as many alternatives. You know, I used to joke with my kids telling them that for Christmas, if I was really good, I got a really nice stick and a nice rock, but otherwise I might get a lousy stick and rock. Oh, shut up, dad. But, um, but I, I think that back in those days, we, you know, we were outdoors a lot and that was the thing. And now there's so much, so much that pulls people in front of the screens. And it's, it's, um, so I think that that's why it's even more vital that, uh, you know, an organization like yours, you know, it's really truly succeeds because every child that spends even an hour a day outside, it's, it's remarkable how much that improves them. It's really, it's really yeah. remarkable. I mean, yeah. do you guys have any, I'm sure you do, but give me an idea of some of the stats that are, there some stats that say, well, look, if, if a child does this, then there, there's a X percent chance that they won't get involved with the bad stuff or. Stuff well, like uh, so $1 invested in, um, social emotional learning, uh, which youth sports is one of the most powerful social emotional learning tools produces a thousand percent return to society. So, uh, you know, there's all kinds of statistics around that. And the thing with sports is it's, it's low hanging fruit, right? It's, it's yeah. such an easy thing to get kids into, uh, and they love it. And it's, you know, it, it serves them in multiple ways, right? They get the, the physical activity, they get to, uh, work on their body, they learn uh, a lifelong uh, love of, you know, being fit, and they actually realize what it feels like to sweat and to uh, work their body. You know, a lot of times when kids are just playing video games and doing schoolwork and, you know, sitting in school, they they don't even know what it feels like to use their body that way. And, uh, you know, kids aren't outside doing physical chores and things, or a lot of them aren't. And, um, so they just don't learn how to use their body in a powerful, effective way. Uh, and sports can teach them that even if they're, you know, just running around and not even that good at the sport, they still get to see that. And it also, they learn how to learn, um, you know, you, you sports is so great because you get to fail over and over and improve every single time. And that happens through practice and games. And um, there's not many things like that that kids get to experience uh, physically. So. Oh, spot on. That's so perfect, Natalie. Thanks for that. Um, so, <clears throat> Michelle, you know, part of what you're trying to address is the is the stigma that surrounds a lot of the, you know, mental health issues that that people go through, and specific, you know, and you're focusing quite a bit on the athlete side. But tell me a little bit about what what may cause some of those mental health issues with with some of the athletes. Um, I mean, they're not all undergoing any PTSD or are they, or what, tell me about that. It's more of what, needing to be the best version of themselves competitive wise. And a lot, there's a big disconnect between athletes and coaches and players are afraid to speak up and say, Hey, I'm having a bad day because when you're in college, they're worried about losing their scholarship, losing their, you know, their playing time, you know, no longer being in the starting position. And so mm -hmm. they hold it all in, which then leads to them turning to alcohol, potentially alcohol, drugs, for example, uh, Chandler Jones, you know, played for the Oakland Raiders and now is off the wagon. He's been in a mental institute once, arrested twice. He's on social media crying for help, but because they don't know how to recognize what he's going through, he's sitting there crying for help. And that's what we're hoping to mm -hmm. do with reducing the stigmas around mental health is these players can say, hey, you know what, coach, I need some assistance, whether it's going to see a counselor or a therapist or finding a group like this to come and just have a safe place to talk about what's going on in their life. Because at the end of the day, again, they're still a human being, you know, they have to go to class. They may want to have a family one day. If they get injured, those injuries could potentially cause them not to have kids in the future. You know, it could impact their marriage, impact their social life. And so we need to change the conversations. So these athletes feel like they still matter without having to score 16 touchdowns or have four interceptions, you know, cause multiple fumbles and sacks. That's not what this is about. It's about these players growing as individuals because in reality, it's their job. This is their job that they got hired for. It shouldn't be what impacts their mental health. Um, now, I, I know the answer, so I'm asking the question anyway. I'm assuming there's there's no age range i mean this hits teens all the way through whatever 80s what etc right 
the biggest impact right now are our high school and college students because, you know, I, I don't know if you know, but most sophomores drop out of college due to anxiety and depression, but because they don't recognize the signs, they drop out of school, they lose their scholarship, and they're like, where do I go from here? Because there's that constant battle of time management. You know, when you're when you're an athlete, you're up at five in the morning going to the gym, doing weights, and you got to go to class, and you got to study for a midterm, you got, you know, practice, you got to get on a plane to go out of state for, for a game. It's just a lot of going. You don't see your family. I mean, I hear the stories of guys not knowing how to do laundry. And so we're actually creating a program to teach them how to do laundry and how to balance a checkbook and how to do all that human stuff because they don't know how to do it. And I think when we teach them, you know, the basics, the essentials, then they're going to feel more, more responsible and be able to combat some of the issues they're dealing with. Well, it's funny you should say that because, you know, a, a lot of the athletes that I work with, they're obviously pretty embarrassed to admit that they don't know how to do these things, but they, they don't want to admit, well, we had people that did all that stuff for us. And I think a lot of times when I, when I speak to an athlete's just retired, they always feel like they are. 10 years behind everybody else. Everybody else has already had a 10 year head start in whatever, the, whatever the profession is. And I try to explain to them, look, you know, actually your, your 10 years was spent professionally in a sport, but you, you were developing skills that companies would absolutely love to have, but they also need what well, you're the help you're just talking about, Michelle, like, she's well, all right. Yeah. But how do I, do, how do I, you know, run down to the store to do blank? How do I get my dry cleaning done? How do you know, it's, it's really, it's really amazing. Um, well, thanks for that perspective. I really appreciate it. Uh, Roy, when you're looking at the, I mean, there are thousands and thousands of, of athlete sports based foundations, charities, nonprofits, and so forth. Are there some that you feel particularly at not individual names, but types of them that you think are particularly compelling to you or not necessarily? I think the ones that are the most compelling to us are the ones where the athletes are really involved directly in providing the services, uh, you know, whether it's with the youth or, or with the organization, uh, as opposed to sort of lending their name to an organization that that's run without them and they're not involved when they give their heart and soul to that organization. And as you said, it doesn't matter particularly what the cause is. It could be financial literacy, STEM education, anti-drug, anti-bullying, um, you know, a lot of the things that you, you were talking earlier with Natalie about why sports are so important to keep kids away from those negative influences. I, I think it's that same element, you know, as Michelle spoke about the, the issues. Um, athletes that are willing to open up and have that conversation and dialogue about themselves and, and share the struggles that they went through. And, and one example I'll give, um, Kayla put together a great event uh, for us last year at the Super Bowl on financial literacy that we did at a Title I high school just west of Phoenix. And we had a dozen athletes that shared their stories. And, and having the kids get the opportunity not to be lectured at, not to hear from, let's say, Roy or Kayla talking about what our experiences are and giving them sort of an academic curriculum, but listening to real live athletes that have gone through those struggles, that have slept on a park bench, that have lost all of their money and had to recreate their lives. Um, it, it makes such an impact in a different way when the athletes give their heart and soul and are part of that process. So to me, that's way more impactful than being sort of the, the lead of a celebrity golf event or a bowling event or a comedy night. Um, those are great. But usually in those environments, that's not where the athletes are opening up and sharing their story. Bingo. So well said. You know, a couple that stand out to me, I mean, one of them is Chris Dickerson, major league baseball player who's got players for the planet. And he is out there with other guys picking up trash at beaches and all that kind of thing. So he gets very involved with it for sure. Uh, another one is work done with his charity that builds homes for, for those that uh, can't afford them and so forth. And he's, He's out there with hammer and nail doing it too. So I, I agree with you, Roy, that, um, you know, when you see the athletes sort of putting their efforts where, where they are, I, I know Tyson Ross, he's, he's got a charity also loyal to my soil and he's out there with the kids playing catch with them and getting them interested in baseball, you know, as much as he possibly can. So um, I do like to see that. So um, with all that, Michelle, 
when you speak to like how do you how do you think let me take a step back when you hear of an athlete or a former athlete or really anyone going through whether it's the ptsd you talk about or any mental health challenges what is the first line of attack what's the first thing that you suggest having an open dialogue with them don't directly talk and say hey so i hear you have depression what's going on share a little bit about yourself so i go to a lot of networking events in person and i usually wear a superhero shirt i know that probably sounds corny you should be dressing up but it actually works because people then can relate to what you're wearing sometimes i wear a cardinal's cap and i get you know joked on about how bad they are but that allows me to kind of feel the situation if they're comfortable talking about sports or comic books or whatever i kind of then tone in with hey comic books helps me with my ptsd which then they go and open up and say hey i have anxiety and depression so fill the room don't directly ask them about their mental health right off the bat you know because <laughs> one we're not counselors so they're gonna be like why are you talking about this but if they hear your own story your own struggles but things that you've done that actually help you with those struggles, they're going to be more open to sharing their own uh, story with you. You know, it's interesting. I, I've, I've read a lot of statistics about uh, that surround mental health. And, you know, one of them is that there's the perception out there that one in five people struggle with their mental health. And I, you know, I've read, for, you know, Eric Houston likes to say five out of five do. It's just a different levels of struggle, but we all have something that we've been dealing with whatever it might be and uh, it was especially challenging during COVID when we were all kind of cooped up and and trying to figure out how to get get around our the voices inside and whatnot so um but it's interesting that you say that it really the open dialogue is it because i think we talk about also some other things that go even a step further with suicide and so forth when people say will say well if i didn't speak to that person i was going to you know so, you know, it, you're absolutely right. Thanks, thanks for that, though, Michelle. That's really, that's really interesting. Natalie, um, when you're working with a lot of, and you see these kids and the impact it's having, I know that you have a, a section, you have the all-star kids and so forth, but tell me a little bit about when you, I mean, I'm sure the experience has to be so gratifying to see a child who's never, you know, thrown a football or hit a baseball or whatever it is, suddenly, you know, experience that you know that the sound of the ball hitting the mitt is one of the like I don't, i'm also going to say like sexiest sounds ever like it's just such <laughs> an amazing sound like you know playing catch right but tell me a little bit about some of the feedback you get not just from the kids but from the parents yeah i mean you know it it, it really can be life-changing for a family uh you know a lot of times i would say about 90 90 plus of the uh, people who are applying for support are uh, moms. They're uh, typically single moms uh, with multiple kids. And um, the, you know, they usually are someone who already believes in sports and sees the value for their kids. And they've been uh, a lot of times, you know, like one season, one kid will get to play uh, the next season, another kid will get to play. And then the next season, the other kid and the younger ones have to wait until they're, you know, they're older because she can't really, you know, afford them all. And, um, and it's just so great through our program that, you know, they all can be playing. And, um, and a lot of times we see like with tackle football, the, the younger girls will be uh, cheer, uh, part of the cheerleading that's part of it. And they're all going to the same place, uh, which, you know, when you're thinking about a low income family, she can't be running her kids to all these different sports. So having something where all the kids can participate um, you know, it was really helpful. Same thing with, you know, like Little League or uh, some of the other programs. And, um, you know, it can be life changing for that family. You know, it can completely change the dynamic. And the other thing I really love um, and that we've seen and heard a lot of is that um, it allows that mom to uh, it changes how they feel about themselves. So when they've just enabled their child to play, even though they've gotten it through support from us, they didn't have to go into the youth sports organization and say, hey, I can't afford to get my kids playing. Can I get, you know, can, can you help me? They're able to do something about it. They're the ones that get online and apply. Uh, we issue them a debit card. They can use that debit card online so they can register just like everybody else. And it gives that mom uh, a sense of self-esteem. And that trickles down to the entire family. And you can see that in, you know, it 
just is, it can change the whole dynamic in the family uh, when you enable those kids to play. And um, it's amazing some of the testimonials we get and the impact that it has, not only just on that family, but on the community as well, because uh, it spreads like wildfire. They, um, they learn uh, about it from, um, you know, from friends and then all of a sudden a lot more kids are playing. When, when a parent sees their child exuding joy, um, there's, there's really no greater feeling. And when, and, well, and win or lose, I mean, there's also, it's tough when your child loses a game, you've got to explain to them that it's not the end of the world and all that kind of thing. But, but it's, it's, it's so fantastic to see how kids react when they're playing sports uh, versus adults. Uh, the other thing is also, there's, it's also fantastic to see a, a child, a teenager, whatever it is, coming back from playing a sport and they're exhausted and it's the best type of exhaustion you can imagine. And, you know, I know Moshe mentioned earlier in one of the comments there that, you know, there's something to be said about, then they don't have that pent up, like, you know, sort of cooped up energy and kind of thing that, um, you know, it's, they're exhausted. I mean, I could say that when I still play, I play men's hockey. And when I play my game and I'm exhausted afterwards, it's such a satisfying feeling about exhaustion and not mental or whatever, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. That's great. Hey, Michelle, so, um, you know, taking a step back a little bit, you mentioned at the very start that um, that you were traumatized by a, a, a rape and, and what happened to you. Do you feel that, is it, how how is it for you to be able to speak about it? Because it's obviously not easy, it's not easy to speak about. And we've talked about this before, but, but if you could share with us, you know, how do you get past that? And is, is it helpful that to know that because you're speaking about it, you're helping other people? I mean, I'm assuming. Okay. <laughs> um, actually, I <laughs> do help other people. I was doing a Facebook Live once about this, my rape and my suicide attempt. And I had somebody message me saying, because of what you just shared, you stopped me from dying by suicide. So I know my story helps. The hard part is because of the stigmas, it's hard. You got to pick your audience. You know, the biggest thing for me is building my B tribe, hence B University, B Dairy, my B tribe. I'm very selective on who is in that B tribe. That B tribe is what keeps me moving forward. When I attempted suicide in 2019, I did not have a sturdy B tribe, which is why I thought that was the only solution at the time. It's about building an inner circle that's small, that you can trust, that you can be open and vulnerable with that isn't going to turn around and use every weakness against you and that's one thing i'm learning is don't share too much if your audience isn't prepared to hear what you're about to say because rape is a topic that's very hard to talk about because you don't know who's been through that type of trauma so i always open the question as how much do you want me to share and my mm -hmm. audience will kind of help me dictate how much i'm going to share in that particular instance that's fantastic uh, because, you know, again, I, uh, you know, when people are more vulnerable, uh, the messaging tends to resonate a lot deeper. And uh, I think that, you know, as, as challenging it is to bring up something that obviously was very traumatic and uh, painful for you, but you are, as you said, you're, you're impacting people. And I know that that's, um, that's not negating what happened to you or taking it away, but I, I hope that every day it's, it's, you know, I don't even know what the right term is here, but it's, you know, it's, it's making that a little bit better, I guess. Every day gets a little easier. Every day I wake up and I'm like, I'm here and I'm still moving forward. You know, their day, the, 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 one thing people have to give themselves time is patience. You know, your trauma is different for everybody and we have right. to give people time to heal. It's not going to take a magic blue pill, as they say, in the, ment in the mental health world that's going to change everything. No, it takes time. It takes patience and empathy and people that want to hear your story. Oh, they do. They do. I mean, um, and yours is, uh, I mean, you know, I, I really do appreciate you sharing, sharing yours today for, you know, it's, it's, um, Again, I, I know that it's it's challenging for almost everybody to speak about things like this. So, you know, thank you for that for sure. Um, Roy, batting next here. I I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm going around the batting order here a little bit, but um, <laughs> but, I, but anyways, but no, I I, I guess um, 
What I want to hear from you, if, if you don't mind, is the the concept of giving back and the concept of philanthropy. I think there's a ton of people out there that don't even know where to start. I, I was actually in a meeting earlier today with somebody and he's, you know, he used to be an athlete and he's, um, you know, pretty decently well off and so forth. But he says, yeah, I asked him, are you involved in any sort of philanthropic stuff? And he says, no, I'm not. But mostly because it's kind of too hard for me to figure out what I should get involved with. And, you know, I, and he wants to do something that's fairly local to where he is. What, what kind of, what can you suggest to somebody who's, is there a, a database somewhere? Is there someplace for people to go or, you know, how can they get involved with something that's going to resonate with them? That's a great question, Mark. And we get that a lot. You know, Kelly and I talk to a lot of athletes about um, what they want to be involved with. There, there's no right or wrong answer, right? One of the struggles is that there is an overload of information. Um, it's not that there's a lack of databases, it's that there's databases with uh, just an overwhelming amount of, of detail. And it's very hard because it really comes to what is your passion, right? So Roy's passion might be different than Kayla's or Mark's or Michelle's or Natalie's. Like you've got to understand what you care about. We, we've got a program that we use uh, called Motivational Values, and we can take people through an exercise of having them walk through that process and identify what's important to them. Because when you look at it in just a pure abstract, right, I could give you a list of 100 organizations. Every single one of them is probably doing great work. You're going to look at all of those causes. You're not going to say, that's stupid, that sucks. I would never consider supporting that, right? But everybody, no matter how much money you have, right, at some point, there's a limited pool. And so, you know, even if you're giving out $20 million, you're deciding, am I going to give it to my university to name a building? Am I going to give it to cancer research? And am, am I going to give it to food insecurity? And so going through that process and identifying for yourself, as you said, Mark, a lot of it is local. Philanthropy is largely driven locally in terms of what people want to see in their own community until you get to very, very high levels where people are looking at that abstract concept of what's best for society. Most people want to see something tangible that they can see on the ground in their community. And so I think it starts with the dialogue, somebody like that, of having that conversation and talking through and helping them you know, it's it's reflective. It's not for Kayla or Roy to decide this is what Mark should be giving to. It, it's having that dialogue and helping talk through what what do you want to be involved with? How much of it is your time? How much of it is your uh, your energy and passion? How much of it is your dollars? And then looking at where you can make a difference because program is not the same. Kayla and I spent. Saturday morning packing uh, at, at her church. And we had, uh, there were 600 people across three shifts packing 100,000 meals uh, in one day. And wow. so it was, it was an impressive operation to see how that all comes together um, and to see how much legwork goes into that process even before the volunteers uh, arrive. So that that's just one example. We've been on the, the phone over the last month with three or four different groups and we're putting together a program at the Super Bowl as well um, with Tackle Hunger. And so there's no shortage of ways to help, right? There, there's always, there's never enough people to help. There's never enough dollars to help everyone. And so at some point um, you just have to identify what cause are you passionate about? Where can you make that impact? because there, there might be causes that I could be passionate about, but I just don't have the necessary dollars or relationship base to make a difference. And then there's others that I know that we can make a connection really seamlessly and, and amplify the impact that's going on. That's the magical word is impact, you know, because, uh, you know, I, there was a, someone else had a, at a, at a charity that she was just trying to raise money to get, um, say sporting goods or you know sporting equipment for kids and she was trying to raise money and i said look instead if you say to somebody if you give a hundred dollars that will be three mitts two you know bats you know a dozen baseballs and you know we'll put your name on the outside of a chain link fence next to this baseball field or something 
well, then I know exactly what my impact is. I know that uh, with Natalie and every kid's sports, I know that if I donate $150, it can get one child playing a sport and that they would not be able to play. I know my immediate impact. I think that's fantastic. Um, but I think that's the thing is that if, if an organization puts out there in more in greater detail, like, boom, if you do this, I mean, sometimes I'll see on late night TV, they show there's an organization in Africa, you know, feed the starving children. If you give 35 cents, it'll feed that. Well, then I know, okay, I, apparently that's where that money is going. And that's, that's a great cause. But um, I think that's the thing, Roy, is that if I know that through my actions and also my resources, my money, that I'm having this impact, that's probably going to resonate the most with me. So I guess that's my big advice to a lot of organizations that are out there is to make it much more obvious that if you give blank, this is what the impact it will have on and and not just keep it nebulous. Like your money is helping support us grow. Blah, blah, blah. I mean, I don't know what that means. So um, I also tend to shy away from the organizations that I get a ton of mail from because all it tells me is that my money is going to buy whole bunch of postage <laughs> and that drives me bleep bleep bleep, bleep crazy <laughs> just, just, just for the record mark i'm gonna just point out one thing which is nonprofits do get a discounted postage rate so they are able to to do that more effectively um and number two that when you look at the surveys and the research on philanthropy that the uh physical requests by mail still have one of the highest rois on that even though it's not you know what we're we're used to they still get a very strong response so then hex start sending out spn stuff let's go roy come on where is it i haven't gotten any in the mail yet let's go um well all right but well thank you for the clarification um it still drives me crazy but thank you for the clarification i appreciate that um michelle how do you think you can um Talk to me a little bit about the impact then from your perspective. If someone wants to donate to your foundation, tell me a little bit about its impact. So anybody, when you donate, so we have a program called uh, Five to Thrive. And the reason I bring this up is because this is our new uh, infrastructure. It's um, dedicated to honor five NCAA athletes who died by suicide last year. So our goal is by you donating to this particular campaign, you're you're part of the Be The Movement. You're the, you're the be the movement that's going to get these athletes to see their value. And we're going to start creating courses to go to different colleges and to different professional sports and say, this is how you help your athletes be successful both on and off the field. Because right now they're so focused on their success on the field. They go home and they probably just sit there, eat junk food, fast food, and not give a care in the world. Well, that is the wrong direction to go. You want to be the best version of yourselves. So we're creating programs about relationships and how to have healthy ones and how to eat right and how to take care of your body from the inside out. So when you go on that field, you feel confident, you feel that inner strength that no matter what, you can up to, you can deal with any obstacle that comes your way. That's great. And so, so uh, I'm going to jump to this part of the segment here. Um, tell me the... Um, Michelle, if you could tell me the website and what's the what's what would have the greatest impact on what you're doing right now? What, how can people help the most for you right now? So we're creating a virtual stadium, and I know that probably sounds. What the heck does a virtual stadium do with mental health? Well, it's going to have 83,000 seats, and those seats represent people who have shared their story across the world. Granted, it's probably going to go up, but that's what we're starting with. Each one of those seats is going to represent somebody and their story. So by donating stadium, you're helping us bring awareness to those stories. We're also going to have a ring of honor to honor those who have tragically died by suicide. And Mark, I'm going to throw this in right now because I don't know if you'll kind of come back to me. We're going to have a Hall of Fame. And I'd like to share that you are the first inductee in the class of 2023 for the B University Hall of Fame for Athletes. Wow. Uh, I'm... I'm uh... I'm pretty, uh, thank you. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, do I get a special jacket for it? Actually, you do. We're working on it um, as we speak. They're, they're creating the sample for you. Is it you. jeans with some uh, rips in it and stuff, or what do you got? No, it's an actual Letterman jacket like oh, you okay. got in high school, but it's actually a really cool one. So, yes, you're going to get a Letterman jacket, a nice wow. little trophy, and, of course, your plaque in the virtual stadium 
where the Hall of Fame is going uh, to be. Very impressive. Thank you so much. So, so back to the stadium thing. So, how can people get involved? So we have a uh, we have a landing page that that is being created right now just mm -hmm. for this. You can buy mm -hmm. custom bricks outside. You know how you get the really cool bricks outside. Yeah. So you have bricks that we you can get custom made with your name, your quote, whatever. Inside you can buy a seat, you can buy suites. And the team I'm working with, we're gonna have live concerts and speaking engagements. So like Roy and Natalie could go talk in the actual stadium and people will be sitting in the seats like they're actually there live at your uh, event so yeah we're gonna have all sorts of really cool this is not going to be just a one and done stadium this is going to be a very inter interactive stadium we're gonna have mental health conferences in there we're gonna have resources you can you can purchase straight from the, from the stadium it's gonna be like your one-stop shop for mental health wow okay that's i mean that's not exactly ambitious or anything but um Wow. Very impressive, Michelle. Well, thank you for that. And what's the website real quick? Um, www. Um, be daring. I'll give it to you because it's a long link. I'll put it in the chat for you guys. Right. And um, you guys will get to see our characters too that we're creating. Wow. Yeah. I, I have to tell everybody that Michelle is one of the most creative people I've run across and she can, um, and a marketing whiz for sure. I mean, that I will tell you. Yeah, amazing. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Natalie. Tell us how people can yes. get involved. Uh, lots of ways. Um, of course, you know, donating to uh, Every Kid Sports is always helpful. Um, and, uh, you know, connecting us to uh, companies, organizations uh, that believe in uh, giving kids access to sports. Uh, we do have, uh, uh, we're super transparent in where every dollar goes. And uh, we have really powerful impact reports. So whatever donation somebody makes, you can see exactly how many kids you've helped. Uh, and when it comes to companies, we can show you exactly where, what sports, how many kids, the gender, the race, all kinds of really great, powerful information. Um, and, uh, you know, our demand uh, uh, far out outseeds the number of kids that we can support. So we have hundreds of th thousands of families coming to us every season. And, uh, you know, we've been able to help uh, five to 10,000 kids every season. And uh, that means we're turning away, you know, 90,000 uh, kids that could be playing sports if we had the funding. So, oh, we need to get that uh, get that in there for sure. You know, it's um, it's we all know people that uh, either have the resources and or have connections into companies that have resources and that sort of thing. So, um, I mean, I'll save that for all three of you. But uh, but anybody involved here today, I mean, if you've got connections uh, that, that, I mean, I'm sure everybody here would love an introduction to them. So, um, but thanks for that, Natalie. Thank you. Every, uh, every kid sports.org. Pretty sure. And be daring foundation.org. I'm pretty sure. And sports philanthropy network.org. I'm pretty sure. But Roy, tell us how people can get involved because, uh, I'll throw it in there that I was, um, they used the Jedi force to, to power, you know, to, to, you know, convinced me to become the New York City chapter director. They stared at me, both of them, Roy and Kayla, and they looked at me straight in the eye and they said, you will be the chapter director in New York City. And I said, I will be the ch So um, I accepted that role, but, but Roy, tell us um, more on how people can get involved. Sure, thanks, Mark. Um, the, the best way for people to get involved, you can look at our website, sportsphilanthropynetwork.org. Um, one of our big initiatives for 2023 has been to launch chapters. So, uh, we've now launched chapters in 17 markets around the country. Um, we anticipate being 30 to 40 markets by the middle of next year. Uh, and the reason for that goes back to what you asked earlier about philanthropy, which is people want to be involved in something in their community yeah. that's much more attractive than sort of a big national scope. And so with our chapters, uh, it, it's been a great start having leaders like Mark in New York and others around the country. Kayla and I have really been excited to open up those chapters and build through a leadership council. So each chapter has a chapter director, and then we build with the chapter director a leadership council of approximately 20 people that's comprised of four committees, events, communications, fundraising, and outreach. And then those chapters are the ones that work to create the programming and the impact for the local community. And what we've seen is that each chapter starts taking on a little bit of its own personality. What what gets done in New York is a little bit different than what gets done in, in Phoenix or Dallas or South Florida. Um, 
and uh, happy to have some of our other chapter directors on here as well today, Michael Wakatama from, from Philadelphia and, and Rob Finkelstein from South Florida, um, you know, who've each had some events in, in their communities. And so we, we encourage everybody to be part of, of what we're doing. Um, if you have the bandwidth to be on the leadership council in your community, that's fantastic. If not, we also have an ambassador program where people can be involved. Uh, we have national networking groups that Mark graciously hosts here for us once a month in the club room where the leadership council and ambassadors from around the country come and participate and get an opportunity to connect and engage with people because that, that's really one of the strengths of the network is people like those of you that are here today that share that passion and vision for using sports for good. That's great. Amazing stuff. Listen, all three of you have to be commended. I, you know, you, you wake up every morning thinking about how you can help and how you can serve. And I truly appreciate that because it's, uh, it's not, unfortunately, it's not typical of everybody. So thanks to all three of you for being here. I truly, truly appreciate it. I do hope that I'll, you know, I'll be posting this on, on YouTube and all over the darn place. And hopefully you guys can share it too, but I do want more and more people to know the fantastic work that all three of you are doing. So um, I look forward to sharing that, but thank you for sharing your time with me today. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, this is wonderful. Oh, thanks. Um, always my pleasure.